Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're here for uh, a public meeting of the Rules and Procedures Committee. We have the Chief Electoral Officer uh, with us. But before we, we get started, I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Green to uh, offer an opening prayer meditation. Thank you. We need to serve our territory to use our resources wisely and well, to represent all members of our communities fairly, to make decisions that promote the common good. We recognize our responsibility to the past and the future and the rights and needs of both individuals and communities. As trusted servants, we seek blessings on our deliberations and on our efforts here today. May we act wisely and well. Amen. Thanks, uh, Ms. Green. Um, my name is Kevin O'Reilly. I'm the chair of the uh, Rules and Procedures Committee. So just before we get started uh, this morning, um, we have an agenda. Um, our main purpose here today is to hear from the Chief Electoral Officer about a supplemental uh, uh, report on the conduct of the elections and uh, a white paper that uh, she has uh, uh, submitted to the Legislative Assembly as well. Um, just before we get started, are there any declarations of conflict of interest? Seeing none, um, what we'll do is uh, just have everybody introduce themselves. So I'll start with uh, Mr. Thompson over here on my left, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, Shane Thompson, Henry Reid. Good morning. I'm uh, Tom Bolio, MLA for Tuned and Mulade. Julie Green, LMF Center. Good morning. Lou Siebert, Tabacho. Good morning. Thanks, uh, everyone. And uh, I, we have uh, our uh, research staff, uh, Lee Selleck, uh, with me on my left-hand side, and then on my right-hand side, our committee clerk, uh, Doug Shawty. Uh So welcome, everybody. This is a public meeting, and uh, um, uh, I'm, I know that uh, Ms. Latour has been with us uh, before, so, uh, of course, all the questions will, will come through uh, me, and uh, um, no need to uh, press the mic on or off our uh, uh, some technician uh, will uh, assist with that. So, um, so uh, yeah, it, this is a public meeting, and we're here to uh, uh, discuss a uh, supplemental report with uh, Ms. Latour, the Chief Electoral Officer, and uh, a white paper that she, she has submitted to the Legislative Assembly as well. So uh, without any further ado, uh, Ms. Latour, would you have some opening remarks, presumably, and want to get going? Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you. I, I did I just try and keep it as brief as possible here uh, so we can get to the questions and discussion. Um, first, I just want to thank this committee. Um, I know that I've given you a, a lot to consider. I think collectively 108 recommendations, <laughs> 47 in, in my reports and supplementary recommendations, and an additional 61 in the white paper for uh, uh, accountability and independence of elections administration in the Northwest Territories. I just want to say a little bit about me. Um, I know I'm innately a change agent. I have the prevent propensity for innovation and, and uh, progress. And I often say, um, and it may become apparent in our discussions today, when I talk about my best and worst attributes, my best attribute is honesty. My worst attribute is honesty. A bit of a double-edged sword. So I know that we're probably going to have some very frank discussions on, on a number of different things today. Um, and I will be giving you uh, honesty. Uh, whatever, however that uh, comes about. Um, I'm about doing, and um, to use some government uh, words, I, I believe in transparency and accountability and in making decisions that lead to maximum efficiency and our fiscally pr prudent use of, of, of Crown funds, government funds. So uh, I'd also like to say that I work for the electorate, not the government. That's important for me to put that out there and that I am not a director of a division of the government. Um, so uh, uh, I think in bringing the, the white paper forward, and I guess most of my opening comments will touch, touch upon that, um, I just felt that it was really necessary, and I provided a briefing note. I don't know how widely circulated it was, but the last four CEOs since 2003 have requested um, a higher level of independence. And I also saw the, really the need for accountability. I think that's part and parcel of building a good relationship and having the communication uh, because we're constantly asked, what do you do in between elections? Um, 
it's uh, you know there's like it, it just people just don't seem to understand the nature of our business. Um, but since uh, you know 2003 and each subsequent CEO, nothing has happened, and each time an assembly dissolves, uh, CEOs are faced with a new board of management, new committees, members, and there's no continuity of initiatives. Um, so the CEO begins the education process all over again in an attempt to solicit, again, the support and understanding of OCEO business. I know we're just one of many fish in the pond, uh, but, um, you know, we'll, I, I speak for myself and, and others, I'm sure, that we'll continue to, um, you know, fight for, for that uh, understanding and, and support. Um, the white paper is intended to bring the office of the chief electoral officer up to the national standard. There's a certain level of amb ambiguity around my level of authority, as specifically where the board of management authority ends and the chief electoral officer's authority begins. Um, and in the absence of guidance on, in many issues related to how a statutory and an, and, uh, an assembly are to relate, this white paper um, proposes a framework for some of that. Um, I find that my office is caught in a world where we need to operate with imposed government policies and practices that do not fit the operational needs or intent of the independence of the office of the Chief Electoral Officer. Uh, this can result in, in what can only be described as significant government interference. And it became apparent to me that the resolution to the continued situation uh, was to present the solution to legislators for consideration. And that's what the white paper is, is that framework with, you know, the, the sort of the, the answers to the, to the various uh, frustrations or issues. Um, it's not an exercise in empire building. The purpose is to ensure the freedom to make decisions and manage an agency with the unique operational needs. Um, it's not to fix a model because there is no model. So it's really essentially uh, an innovation in, in terms of developing, developing one, in my opinion. So I'm happy to be present today to answer the questions and share some of the issues in order to facilitate the adoption of some or all the recommendations contained in this paper. Again, my long game is to gain the understanding and subsequent support of the legislators in the work that we are trying to do. Uh, it is my desire to achieve clarification on how my office uh, should interact with the assembly. That's it for, for opening comments. I, the, the four recommendations, I think, just sort of stem off my initial report we spoke to earlier. Okay, thanks uh, very much for those opening comments. Um, I'm just wondering whether we, we might start with uh, the supplemental report. If uh, that's agreeable to uh, committee, um, and this was uh, we've uh, tabled in uh, the house on uh, June the first by the speaker, and uh, offers uh, four additional recommendations to your uh, uh, elections report. Uh, um, maybe uh, Ms. Latore, I could just get you to would you mind just uh, highlighting these for us briefly that the four recommendations. Um, and of course, we're, we're being broadcast, so here's an opportunity to uh, send that message out to a broader audience as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's there's four recommendations here. Uh, three are, uh, are fairly uh, significant, I think, and, and the fourth one is, is a housekeeping uh, kind of uh, an issue that uh, I really should have probably made the 44th recommendation in my initial CEO report. But since I, I had to bring these three forward, I thought I would just tack it on to the end. Um, the first, the 44th recommendation is with respect to the requirement for a financial institution. Without question, this is one of the most significant barriers to candidates and their official agents in submitting their candidate financial reports. And part of the problem, as I break down here, is that of the communities, uh, you can see in the comparative analysis that uh, 11 of the 33 communities have neither a chartered uh, bank uh, or an institution that I can approve to um, run their, uh, their funds through. 
Um, when you look at the entire picture of how we uh, our, our, elector, our election process here, one has to wonder if uh, it's necessary. And we're very unclear of the rationale as to why a bank is required in the process. The banks actually also uh, have their own uh, policies and things of that nature that candidates and my office become subject to. Um, they're not really something that we can expect. They're different every time. Um, but when candidates take their slip from their nomination papers that bears the returning officer's signature and declares them an official agent in, the G in a general election and the bank sends them away saying that's not good enough, um, and that they could make it at home, was one comment on a photocopier, then we have a bit of an issue. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's just really difficult for some candidates in the outlying communities to have their official agents set up a bank account without attending the bank. So right off the top, um, th there's a significant barrier there, and some candidates and official agents just choose to ignore that portion of their obligation under the Act and carry on. Uh, they're in the writ period. Uh, so when it comes time to, for them to um, complete their candidate financial report, there's an absence of that paperwork. And we're having to make exceptions. I mean, we do have the understanding. So it just became plain to us uh, to, to uh, uh, you know, look, have a look at it in depth and, and bring it forward. I think of the 60 or 59 that I've received thus far, only one was able to achieve a completeness that included timely bank statements. Because if you pay something with a check, if you set it up as a checking account and you pay an individual for your signs, for example, as the end user, there's nothing that guarantees them to go and cash that check. They could put it in their back pocket and sit on it for months. And the Act requires that uh, these accounts are closed out and that everything is essentially balances. And, you know, we think about the rationale that must have, you know, brought this in. And I think it was probably adopted from um, the federal statutes that was really geared to um, where party politics are involved and to ensure that money isn't changing hands between candidates and things of that nature. But because we're consensus and everybody files independently, it seems to us that the cash flow sheet within um, um, the candidate's financial report would suffice in showing contributions in, contributions out, because it's directly tied to uh, the official receipts, the tax receipts. So we can see that, but there's, you know, it's really hard to break it down. We we think that maybe it was from an audit perspective, uh, but if somebody um, solicits a number of anonymous donations um, uh, and they're not issuing a receipt because they're, it's under the allowable level, they can make a bank deposit for X number of bucks and cents, and we have no way of actually breaking it out. So is it sens a sensible expectation? And we don't believe that it is, and we find that it's a fairly significant barrier uh, for candidates and their official agents to be able to comply with uh, with the act so that's the first one in a sense um, the candidates uh, Sorry, I'll, I'll just uh, stop you there if that's okay sure uh, um, what we'll do is maybe just go through each of them and see if uh, committee members have any questions on that uh, any questions on this recommendation Ms. Green uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Latour, I was wondering how many candidates ran in the last election from communities where there are no financial services? Ms. Latour. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I can't tell you that right off the top of my head. Uh, I can certainly get that information for you. Okay, thanks, Ms. Latour. Uh, Ms. Green, any other questions? No, thank you. I appreciate uh, that commitment. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions on this one for Ms. Latour? I, I know the committee, rest assured that committee has been looking at your reports. Spent, indeed, we've been spending a significant amount of time on your reports. Uh, we've had a few other assignments that have intervened uh, that uh, uh, required um, uh, firm deadlines. So uh, we have been looking at your materials. We've got a lot to look at as you've uh, 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 identified as well. So, uh, but um, anything further on this one? If not, maybe we'll go on to the next one. I, I think it's fair to say on this one, um, we've had some discussion and I think we're inclined to agree with you, but uh, uh, the next one is 45. Uh, Ms. Latour, maybe you could just highlight some of this for us as well. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, it deals with candidate financial reporting. Um, it's uh, it's a, a struggle to get the reports in um, in the most accurate and complete way that they're intended to be received in our office. Uh, our office spends a lot of time um, asking questions, completing the Canada financial reports, uh, bothering candidates and official agents for the paperwork that's supposed to accompany them, and and um, all, all the rest <laughs> that goes into submitting an accurate and complete report. Um, so it's, um, it's time consuming and costly to the government to meet an obligation that really lies with candidates and, and official agents. Um, sometimes uh, we can struggle to find a qualified person on a short-term basis to conduct the reviews that possesses the level of uh, knowledge required to ensure uh, that a, an appropriate framework is developed and that it's uh, applied in, in a fair way. So that's a, a bit of a concern from an internal perspective. Um, this proposes that we adopt a practice that, as you can see, is well used um, throughout Canada. Only the Yukon and, and Nunavut uh, do not require an audit prior to the submission of it. Um, so we looked at it and um, it's, um, it seems that it's a reasonable uh, model to propose that, that differs, but there's also, we feel, a significant cost savings to this. And it, we feel that it also helps the candidates and official agents um, is to have the um, candidate financial reports certified by a designated accounting official of some sort. The level can be determined uh, at another time. And then to subsequently reimburse the candidate for that cost. And so what we sort of suggest, and again, it's, it's up to the legislators where that amount, if they pick up this model, may be set at. But for an example, that $1,500 is the allowable amount. We think that the simplification of the candidate's financial report as it exists now, and, and we will do a, a little bit further work. We, we got great feedback on it last event of how the level that we did simplify it to, that is something that could be completed by a, a, a designated uh, accounting person uh, probably within anywhere from two to five hours. And, you know, we're assuming a rate of maybe 300 bucks an hour. That $1,500 would be probably uh, enough to, to, to do that. Then the reports would come into my office as intended, accurate and complete. We wouldn't review them because it's been certified. By the, by the accounting official. Uh, they would only be subject to query in the event that there was a complaint or some, some type of an investigation which, which had us look at it. Um, and so what this does, if we say that it's 1,500 uh, reimbursable, um, we spread out the economics of the election as well as we engage um, election agencies or bookkeepers or whatever you may have in other regions of the NWT to, to go over those papers and certify them as being complete and accurate. Um, but we also save money and if we use the example of 60 candidates, which was a high, and at $1,500, that's $90,000 in reimbursement fees. Okay, so I use that as sort of a worst case scenario. I can tell you that what we spent to have a, a, a casual employee in the office of the chief electoral officer primarily to conduct this exceeded $150,000. So there's a savings there. So we know that by outsourcing it per se, that there is a level of professionalism that's engaged, that the reports come in accurate and complete on a deadline that actually conforms with the act, right? And we save money. So uh, it's, it's a practice that's used in other jurisdictions as, as the uh, comparative analysis shows you. And we just think that it's something that was worthwhile putting forward for your consideration. It will require additional education for the candidates and the official agents, uh, but we think that that's something that's uh, very manageable and it's our, in our, our, our intention to actually do a lot more um, upfront education with the individuals who are uh, considering candidacy and in filling roles as official agents. So we don't think that it's any, it's much more work than something uh, that we intended to do anyway. Okay, thanks for that, uh, um, Ms. Latour. Uh, uh, I know that um, Mr. Thompson you indicated you would like to ask some questions of Ms. Green. So let's start with Mr. Thompson. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
Thanks, Ms. Latour, for the explanation. I guess my first question is, to simplify, could you look at simplifying the forms to make them more easily used by the return or not by the agent? And have you looked at that first instead of this option? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Thompson. Ms. Latour. Absolutely. This past event, the form was drastically simplified. It was made form fillable. It toggled, it's auto summed and toggled where one sum should appear in another. So the carryover and everything was there. We think it's probably as simple as it can be in order to conform with what is required under the reporting section of the Act. There's a couple of things that we're going to fix up. I mean, we had it as PDF form fillable. We're going to go to HTML, for example, because we're not sure what the endpoint user is using as a system. So there were some issues with how the numbers were there. But everything that's asked for in that form is directly related to what's required in the Act that they have to put forward. And we put it forward in the most simple way. And we also expanded the instructions in the lead up, significantly broke them down. So it doesn't get much simpler than that. But we're still having issues with people completing it. Okay. Thanks, Ms. Latour. Mr. Thompson? When you talked about, oh, thank you, Ms. Latour. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So when we're talking about cost savings, and when I heard $1,500 per, that would be the cost. And so you're saving about $60,000. My biggest challenge is the fact that how many chartered accounts are out there? Have you looked at that? And have you looked at where these chartered accounts are? Because my experience and my time dealing with chartered accountants, we're looking at the major centers, Hay River, Fort Smith, and Newbick, and nothing in Fort Smith. So anyway, so what I'm saying is that, you know, major centers, I'm looking at my community, there is no chartered account. There's none on that list. So have you guys looked at that as a barrier? Because to me, this is going to put a barrier up for outside the larger centers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Thompson. Ms. Latour? Well, again, it's open to say what level of certification that accounting professionals should have. I mean, I'm fairly well aware of a lot of bookkeeping services in the outside communities, and that may be the level that we set it at. And bookkeepers generally come with some level of certification. So that's something that, you know, that can be determined here as to, you know, how it should, what level and how it should, you know, come into us. It's, I don't think that difficult either for official agents to put the form and the supporting documentation into an envelope and mail them to the bigger centers for completion either. I don't think that the postage in that is that much of a cost barrier if they have the discussion. So I think that there's still ways to facilitate it. Can I say that there's an accountant in every or a bookkeeper in every community? No. I have more questions. Just put me on the list. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ms. Latour. And thanks, Mr. Thompson. So I'll put you back on the list. I've got Ms. Green next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, the language in the supplementary recommendation talks about audit and a person registered as in good standing with the Certified General Accountants Association. So are you proposing an audit or you're not proposing an audit? I'm a bit unclear after hearing your remarks to Mr. Thompson. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Green. Ms. Latour? We're not essentially audit might not be the appropriate word. I think that, you know, comes from language used interjurisdictionally. It's really about bringing the reports to completion and an individual certifying that it's accurate and it's complete. So it may be audit may be, I mean, it may be the wrong word. Okay. Thanks, Ms. Green. Thanks, Mr. Thompson. The case just argued will be submitted for decision.
Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Ms. Latour. Uh, Ms. Green? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. It's, it's a key distinction uh, because going on to another segment of your recommendation, you're, you're saying that, uh, that the candidates would be reimbursed for up to $1,000. Um, when I read this recommendation, I asked a couple of people who are knowledgeable about fees uh, about the cost of having an audit, because that's what this says. Uh, of my financial statements for the election, and they suggested it would be in the five to ten thousand dollar range, and so um, that would leave me having to budget a third of my, uh, at least a third of my total uh, budget for auditing the statement at the end. Is is that reasonable? Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Ms. Green, and I guess further. Uh, um, I note from your report that the audit fees are not a your, – your recommendation is that the audit fees not be an allowable expense uh, in terms of uh, fundraising and so on during elections. But uh, please go ahead and if you can help with that. Thank yeah, you. I think I think audit, you know, is probably not an appropriate term. Like I said, it's really about having uh, somebody with um, the knowledge, ensuring that the report – is complete, it, 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 it obtains the zero balance, and that all the supporting documentation is there. So I, I think, you know, that individual that does that will have to look through it in some and make sure that everything is there. So from that perspective, it is a bit of an audit. It's not an audit in the sense of a full-blown audit, uh, you know, maybe, like I said, maybe that's not the correct language, but the individual um, that's, you know, uh, would sign it off as being uh, certified true and correct uh, would, would undertake somewhat of a, 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 a review, maybe that's a more appropriate word, and, and ensure that um, everything is, is uh, presented in the um, candidate's financial report as it should be. Thanks, uh, Ms. Latour. Um, Ms. Green, anything further on this, or can I? Uh, yeah, I just I want to go back to the cost. How did you arrive at a reimbursable amount of $1,000? Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Green. Ms. Latour? Well, as I've said, it's something that we just used as um, um, a preliminary figure. Um, and and I, I think I explained the math is looking at the, the candidate's financial report, we think that reasonably it's a two to five hour exercise and said a reasonably a reasonable amount for that uh, to use a, an accountant uh, uh, um, like a C, CGA or something would be maybe a, a, in the neighborhood of uh, three, 300 bucks an hour. Um, that's not for me to set. It's just something that's it's a suggested amount, and we used um, again some comparative analysis to other jurisdictions for their amounts of um, reimbursement. And we don't think that the completion of our Canada's financial report is anywhere near as complex as the completion of uh, CFRs in other jurisdictions. Okay, thanks, uh, Ms. Latour. Uh, Okay, I've got uh, Mr. Siebert next. Thank you. I uh, share some of the uh, concerns that Ms. Green has expressed because, um, of course, the accountants have changed now. I think it's called CPA. Did we have some legislation about that <laughs> very recently? And uh, usually when there's a certification at the bottom of uh, something, usually uh, CPAs are pretty um, determined to guard that sort of duty. I know the lawyers are. So that if someone is certifying, it seems to me that they are going to be needing some sort of designation. And I, I see some of the problems that Ms. Green has uh, has noted. And also Mr. Thompson, uh, um, you'd have to get somebody. There may be uh, people with designations in the government, but I don't think I could use those. And I would have to use my usual accountants who are actually in Hay River. And I think everybody else would be stuck pretty well sending their stuff to Hay River or Yellowknife. So could be a logistic problem there, but I share Ms. Green's concerns otherwise. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, um, Mr. Siebert. Uh, sounds like more of a, a comment than a question, but uh, Ms. Latour, anything further you'd like to add on this? Yeah, I think what's suggested here is really in line with uh, having your taxes done, taking your taxes to, uh, you know, a professional to have them completed. 
So uh, I don't think that is just, uh, I don't think anybody <laughs> continues to do that if the bill is five to $10,000 or whatnot. I think this is a very simple exercise for a professional to undertake. I think there could potentially be some logistical uh, hiccups. It's the same thing, you know, it really mirrors what we have to deal with the, uh, the banking. Um, and I think that we can work with candidates from my office to help them facilitate those needs uh, as we do with uh, with the banking stuff. So, um, you know, the recommendation is, is a suggestion to uh, help uh, official agents that don't possess, say, strong numeracy skills, literacy skills, um, to bring the CFR to fruition within the timelines and within the expectations of the act. It's, it's just not being met. Of the 59 that I received of 60, only one has conformed as it should. So we had to look at alternate solutions, engaging somebody who really has the wealth of knowledge in this exercise just seemed like the most logical um, uh, proposal. Other than that, uh, you know, they're going to still come in half complete, incorrect, and the burden is going to be on our office to bring them to completion. And that's substantial and a costly effort. Thanks, uh, Ms. Latour. Uh, got Mr. Thompson again on my list. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess my next one, um, when I'm looking at this, as we're putting a barrier for people that don't do a lot of fundraising, this is going to have to come out of pocket. So, did you look at this as a real, as a, when you made this decision, this recommendation, did you take that into account that this money is coming out of people's personal pockets and elections are costing are costly enough as it is and they've already made a commitment to run so that they're, they're not going to fundraise a, a whole bunch of more, a lot of money out there. So did you look at this as, a, you know, a b barrier that people are going to have to incur through this process? Thank you. Mr. Thanks, uh, Mr. Thompson. Yeah, just to be clear, um, Ms. Latour's recommendation is that uh, you can't use funds raised uh, during the campaign to cover off the audit costs. That would have to be, a, I guess, presumably a personal expense for a candidate. But Ms. Latour, do you want to respond? Thanks. Yeah, with all due respect, I think there's some significant confusion here to what I'm proposing. What I'm proposing is that there's a reimbursement of those funds. That means that my office pays that accountant for the completion of the records. And the savings is that the reimbursement amounts collectively will be less than me hiring a casual individual that doesn't have the skill level that an accountant has. So it's not out of anybody's pocket. It's a cost I'm going to bear. So you could in effect bring me your report and an invoice, and even if the invoice is, let's say we work with the $1,500, if the invoice is $2,000, and you didn't communicate to the uh, your person that you need to s that that's the level, then I will still pay 1,500 of that 2,000. If it comes in at 900, we pay the invoice totally, and there's a cost savings to the government, and and there's a certainty for the official agent in knowing that the the paperwork is is completed to an acceptable complete level. Like essentially, it's done for them. We don't have to chase them around for for stuff. And, and that they're, you know, they're, they're in compliance with the act. So there's no cost to the candidate. This is a supporting uh, recommendation. It provides them with professional level to help them complete the CFR at our expense. And it's still in the long run from the government saves us money and time. Okay, uh, thanks Ms. Latour. I, I think one of the concerns here is that the, uh, there's some concern from committee members that the audit cost may actually exceed $1,000, and if it does, uh, the candidate may have to assume those, those costs themselves. But uh, in any event, um, Mr. Thompson, did you have any further questions? Yeah. Um, so, so I guess just to build up on your answer there, so you, we make a recommendation, it's 1500 it comes in at $3,000. It's if that money still comes out of the person's pocket, fifteen hundred dollars. Am I correct in understanding the scenario that we're talking about here? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Mr. Thompson. Ms. Latour. Yeah, that, that would be correct. Uh, the other thing that can be done um, is what Nunavut does. 
Nunavut has this practice, but Nunavut goes ahead and contracts a single accounting firm, and all the CFRs are run through that firm. I mean, but that's just equivalent to having a casual person as well, too, other than you get the professional. But I, I, I believe that that's going to come in to be more expensive. Now, we haven't done the micro uh, research on prevent, presenting the uh, candidate's financial report to an accountant, per se, and said, here's a bunch of mock whatever. Tell us what it's going to cost to put us together. But we think that it's going to be in the neighborhood of completing your tax return. And if you're telling me that the completion of a tax return is around $3,000, I would suggest that you need another accountant. I, I think that, that it's a very straightforward form. It's, it's very simplistic. So I, I'm not so concerned about uh, costs like that. And, you know, if initiatives such as this is to move forward, I'm sure that there could be some, you know, types of, uh, I don't know, negotiations, for lack of a better word, on rates from certain accountants and perhaps uh, the provision of a list of accountants that are willing to complete a CFR for a flat fee um, would be something that we, we could uh, look at. But I'm also suggesting in this recommendation for those people that get zero contributions and have zero that we look at another means, a declaration saying uh, for the last two points here, that a claimed or non-elected candidates who receive and spend very little completing the fully audited, we use the word audited here, candidates financial report seems like an unnecessary exercise. So, um, you know, and I provide some stats over the last three electoral events, 32% of candidates have spent less than $3,000. 11% of them have spent less than $1,000. So would it not make more sense to have a declaration saying any pre-election or election expenses incurred have been paid in full and I made less than $1,000 and have them uh, sign that stat and forego a full-blown um, exercise in completing the CFR. It doesn't make a lot of sense for us. So, that, you know, that's something that's tied into this recommendation and something that I think is um, because we have a consensus government and we experience acclamations, um, is it something that just is better suited? You know, because we had, uh, we had individuals that were claimed and had no idea that they had an obligation to, to submit anything. So... Okay. Uh, thanks, Ms. Latour. Uh, Mr. Thompson? I have another for... couple more, but Ms. Green can go ahead. Okay, thanks. We'll go to uh, Ms. Green. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. You mentioned that only one out of 59 conformed to the standards you'd set. Um, what uh, is your analysis of the problem there, other than the fact that people are not completing the form? Why is it only one out of 59? And is that typical with other electoral events? Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Green. Ms. Latour? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I can tell you <laughs> the greatest confidence that they're all related to banks, having complete and accurate bank records. It's impossible as it, as it is right now. And even the one that was came in in the math was correct in, in the whole thing uh, in the review. Um, that individual still had his official agent came to us and said, I still can't get stuff for the bank. I'm going out of town. It could come in and, you know, and negotiated that with us. And uh, it did come in within the uh, within the 60 days. But again, he, he right after the event, he, he got right to it. He had everything in order, but he still, you know, um, was was tied to them. And then the rest of them. Yeah, it's just missing supporting documentations, but probably I'm going to say 90, 95 percent of it is bank records. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ms. Green, anything further on that? Um, so if we adopted Recommendation 44, which takes the financial institution requirement out, is there a need then to, to do this, uh, this uh, costly exercise in, in uh, reviews, audits, whatever they are going to be at the end of the day? Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Green. Ms. Latour? Uh, it would certainly lessen the need for 45. And uh, further to that, I think if you adopted 44 and 45, even if you uh, changed them to be a better fit, we wouldn't be talking about 46, <laughs> which is another ball of wax. So there's um, certainly things we can do. And also, uh, to give uh, serious consideration, to those individuals that are, have have raised nothing or have been acclaimed. Yeah. 
Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Ms. Latour. Uh, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So when we're looking at this long recommendation, is there points in here that we should seriously be looking at? Um, that if say, say if I'm going to say I don't support this recommendation because of X and Y, but there's A, B, C here. Is there points in here that we should be looking at that would shrink this recommendation to help you through the process? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Mr. Thompson. Ms. Latour. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, this is a recommendation. It's for your determination. It's my, my best suggestion as to what could happen. I don't think it's necessarily um, um, even complete. It's what we could think of that made the most sense and, and putting it to you uh, as uh, for consideration. I mean, there may be parts you say no, uh, but I like that, but it needs to be changed to meet this or whatever. And again, um, that's uh, at your discretion. So um, I've just put forward what I think is the best solution um, from my perspective and and let it uh, be what it is after you, you've had your discussions. Okay, thanks, Ms. Latour. Anything further, Mr. Thompson? Yeah, um, in regards to the audit and reimbursement on page 13, you talk about the different jurisdictions here. How many of these actually are party that this is parties easily they can easily do this because I'm looking at the consensus. The only one that's a party is the, for the territories is the Yukon, and they don't do it. None of it. This actually hires a, con uh, a contractor that does it, from my understanding, what you you said. So again, the rest of these are all seem to be parties, and they have built in this process. So when you looked at this and this. Um, uh, comparison. Did you think about the fact that we are a non-party election and we follow through on this? And this is going, like I say, could come back to be a cost to um, the candidates later on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Mr. Thompson. Ms. Latour. Um, absolutely. I mean, uh, the Yukon. Uh, I know that I, I can't speak for the Yukon as to why they haven't gotten there, but I, I couldn't say that they're not considering it. Um, Nunavut. Um, they just because of the logistics and things that occur in Nunavut. Uh, this is the best situation, and like I've shared with you, their their CFRs do go through a review. It's just a negotiated contract. Instead of, instead of uh, we hire a casual individual, instead of uh, the CEO he hiring a casual CGA person per se, uh, they just run it through, and it, it all comes to his office as as complete and correct. So they assume that cost, and I don't know what it would be. I think it's fairly substantial though. Okay, thanks, Ms. Latour. Mr. Thompson, anything further? No, I thank Ms. Latour for that answer. Okay, thank you. I've got uh, Mr. Bolio. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to ask the uh, uh, CEO on, um, on the uh, fourth section of the recommendation it talks about reimbursable expenses and then paid directly. It uh, indicates both in that, uh, in that paragraph. I just wanted to know which one it is. If it's reimbursable, I'm assuming that means that um, the candidate would pay cash to the accountant and then bring the receipt and then the, this office reimburse? Or is it paid directly by the office? Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Polio. Uh, Ms. Latour? Um, I'm unsure which are we on, page 12, fourth paragraph? Yeah, that's, thanks, Ms. Latour. I think it's yeah, page 12, the fourth paragraph there. There, there might be. Um, a couple of different ways of interpreting that, whether the, the candidate has to upfront the money and uh, would the candidate would get reimbursed from the CEO's office or whether the invoice would go directly to the CEO for payment. So I think if you've got a, um, a preference or uh, some views on that, I think that would help with the answer. Thank you. 
Um, so as this is written, it suggests to include uh, the, the uh, auditor, for lack of a better word, invoice for, uh, for less than or equal to the maximum set reimbursable amount of $1,000 we use here, for example. Um, so that's essentially saying the report would come in and you would bring the invoice um, for the individual. That doesn't necessarily mean that you need to pay the invoice up front. That's the invoice, and uh, we will accept the, uh, the, the, the report and, and pay the, uh, the individual directly from our office. Thanks, Mr. Tour. Does that answer your question, Mr. Bowen? Okay. Thanks. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, look, I, I want to thank you for highlighting this issue. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I think we have some different views maybe on what the ultimate solution may be. But uh, sure. um, look, I think you've, you've highlighted uh, a couple of very interesting issues for us about uh, um, how to uh, um, get this work done properly on time. and. Um, the fact that some candidates really don't incur a lot of expenses or, or those that are acclaimed, you know, maybe there's a different way to handle those uh, uh, to remove some of the burden from them. So, uh, and we've also heard you say that uh, you're going to be looking at revising the forms uh, and providing some additional uh, uh, direction to official agents. I know uh, from personal experience, if we could get those forms in a way that's actually uh, savable, uh, so that they don't have to enter all the data, go off somewhere, and then you lose it all. Uh, that, that would be, I think, a, a great assistance. But uh, um, in any event, I want to thank you for raising this this issue. You've, you've proposed some solutions. We've got some experience from other jurisdictions to look at. Uh, we may want to go off and do a little bit more work ourselves on this. But uh, yeah. I want to thank you for uh, bringing this forward. Any okay. any closing comments on this one? Or? Uh, I just want to say with respect to the forms, like I, I, we, that was our first go around to make it uh, accessible and, and make it a digitally, you know, uh, responsible. But the, the endpoint user, we realized quite quickly, <laughs> it was uh, a bit of an issue. So um, we are going to make the effort to make the forms HTML. Uh, which will help a lot uh, for them to be able to be saved upon completion, um, perhaps even emailed a bunch of different things so that, that there's a, a lot more options for, for the candidate. Um, so absolutely. Uh, but we do think that we made uh, quite a, a good gain in, in uh, how we, we simplified and we heard back from candidates uh, uh, on that. So we think we're going in the right direction. It will just continue to get better. Sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. So let's move on to uh, um, um, recommendation 46. This is the uh, vote on compliance penalties. Uh, Ms. Latour, do you want to make a few introductory remarks and then we can get into some questions? Thank you. Uh, thank you. And as I touched upon before, uh, if there's some uptake on recommendations 44 and 45, we probably won't be dealing with 46 as much as we, as we currently are. Uh, this to me... Um, I will tell you that right now I'm in the midst of trying to uh, get a signature on a compliance agreement from the 60th candidate uh, who did not complete a plan of financial report uh, and did not pay his administrative monetary penalty of $250. The problem with the $250 and why this has been brought forward is, as I say, we're just not sure that it's enough of a, deter a deterrent for noncompliance. And what we are spending on chasing a $250 fine is, is concerning because it's not only my time and effort, but I now have a Crown Prosecutor involved. Charges have been laid. If this individual does not sign the compliance agreement, um, I will travel. The Crown Prosecutor will travel. The Finance Officer will travel to the outlying community in this instance. And there's significant costs associated with that just to chase down a $250 penalty. That's what we're up against right now. So I'm just saying we need a different mechanism because um, the other thing is, is, you know, we could just say pff, nothing. So I'm essentially saying that the, the Act has no teeth. So uh, how the Act is currently written, I, I'm, I'm in this position now, and it doesn't make very much sense to me. I think that we, we need to look at different ways um, of, of uh, either collecting the penalty if it's to stay as it is, and that's what I have proposed uh, 
um, in this recommendation. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, any questions from uh, committee? Uh, Ms. Green. Uh, thank you. Um, my first question is, um, when you get to the point of non-compliance, what is preventing people from complying? Are they uh, missing records or are they making a choice? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ms. Green. Ms. Latour? I really can't speak to that. I'm going to say yes to both, a combination to both. I, I really don't know what prevents them, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the situation. Okay. Thanks, Ms. Latour. So it's fair to say that you've come across both of those situations. But uh, yes. is, uh, Ms. Latour, or sorry, Ms. Green, in for anything further? Uh, yes. Do, do you think that your office could provide greater education in this area? Would that, do you think that would make any difference? Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Green. Ms. Latour? Um, the 250 was an amendment uh, to the last, uh, and, and so it was a change at the last event. I think we can do a better job and maybe writing it in big red uh, letters in the, uh, in the guide that that's the obligation uh, of the official agent and the candidate. Um, I don't know, you know, how much more education we can say if you don't complete your CFR within the 60 days and you do not have an extension afforded to you that you must pay the $250 penalty, right? It's just how we're going about collecting the penalty, I think, is the, is the problem, okay. not the education. Thanks, Ms. Latour. Uh, Ms. Green, anything further? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bolio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, I think the um, official agents now, um, uh, I mean, for candidates to get official agents sometimes could be a bit difficult. If um, the official agent is saddled with um, possible fines whether the, the official agent um, uh, is not causing the, the issue, if the candidate's causing the issue, somebody that's trying to help a person out ends up being fined in the future, I think it would be very difficult to get official agents. I, I, and also, I think overall your official agent almost has to be an accountant in order to uh, f comply to, to the rules. I think that um, this is a bit too punitive on um, for for um, uh, what um, the I guess the, the uh, uh, violation uh, to to the act is at this point. The recommendation I think that's it's fine as is, or it could be a little a, a little bit higher, but it should be um, clearly understood. I'm not sure that we're able to educate our official agents quickly enough get them up to speed on what their obligations are. I think that uh, we need to have a lot more discussion on, on the, the magnitude of this uh, recommendation. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mr. Willey. So probably some more comments than um, questions, but uh, uh, I, I'd like to give you a chance to respond, Ms. Latour. But in, in the case of uh, a candidate uh, fi failing to file a financial report, are, is the official agent and the candidate uh, liable to the $250 fine, or is it just the official agent? Maybe we can just get that clarified. Thanks. Actually, as it's written, it's candidate only that, that is um, on the hook for the $250. The obligation, however, lies with the official agent. So, I mean, I currently have arrest warrants out for an individual, you know, that failed to show in court. And, uh, you know, we, we're, we're spending all this, this time and money um, and for whatever reasons. Um, and I am prepared to accept uh, the compliance agreement um, in the discussions with the candidate and the Crown Prosecutor and the candidate's attorney uh, without the signature, which is the full declaration in the CFR, and that's what the Act asks for. They really, they really get charged with failing to make the declaration, but part and parcel, the making the declaration is, is the completion of the CFR. 
The CFR is paramount. I'm spending time chasing people for the $250 fine. I really don't care about an administrative monetary penalty, to be quite honest. What I, what I care about is uh, getting the, uh, the CFR. I have an obligation to publish it and, um, and ensure that everything was, you know, essentially by the book. So uh, this penalty was a new amendment. And I, I, uh, I, I don't know what the answer is. I, I encourage you to look at the act, how it's written, and what I'm tasked with administering right now, uh, because to me it doesn't make sense. So by all means, uh, looking at this from different angles as legislators, if you have a better solution to it, uh, an, an alternative, uh, that's fine. But, but right now, what is $250? the amount of effort and, like I said, time and money to, to, to chase that. And still, that's not the end game. The end game is getting the CFR. Uh, it, that's, that's where I'm at. So whatever you can bring to the table, that's great. And I understand, I take your point on of people not wanting to serve as official agents because of the ramifications of, of you know, bolstering that, that section of the Act. Um, and that's part and parcel why 45 is there, is to say, look, you don't have this, and here's your support over here is getting a designate to do that. Just make sure you keep your papers, you have everything, you can provide them with everything to complete it. And then, you know, that assists the candidate and official agent and, and brings them into compliance. Because right now, I mean, we have to make so many different exceptions uh, with candidates to, to ensure that the records that sit in my office are accurate and complete, uh, that uh, we're already not conforming to the law. So, you know, if, you, if there is uh, some other thoughts on, on how this can be achieved, then, and then that's fine as well. And, and I made the point in Recommendation 45 that even individuals that are duly elected, if they bring me their uh, report on the 60th day, there's absolutely no way my office can ensure accurate and correctness as, as I'm supposed to. It takes us a few days to go all through that, but if they take it to a person who certifies and it's done, it comes that way. There's no question about it because I would have to go back, and this is a thing where you have ongoing discussions all the time with candidates. Well, you're missing this or that's not here or there's an error here. Can you explain this? And then we end up completing the CFR. Right? And chasing people for, you know, an invoice from such an airline to do whatever. And they said, well, you know, the airline is this and that. And we have to say it's your responsibility to chase the airline and get it to us. We're just telling you still it's outstanding. So, you know, uh, we get pressured from the press to publish these things, and we just went ahead and published them as we had them this time because we realized that getting them all together and then making one disclosure on the spending was not possible. And as I said, I'm still uh, chasing my 60th candidate, and I'm going to have to come to some form of agreement with the individual to accept his CFR in whatever form, pretty much as he sends it to me, in the absence of the signature of his official agent. So it's, it's really odd how it's laid out right now. The official agent is legally bound to give it to me. The penalty goes to the candidate. OK, uh, thanks. Uh, I think we have a better appreciation <laughs> of the issues again. I want to thank you for that. I've got uh, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So. I guess my question to you is, you, what other alternatives out there have you looked at <clears throat> besides the fine? Is it, have you looked at the ability that candidate cannot run in the next election or until he gets these pieces of necessary documents to you? <clears throat> or is it just the punitive uh, of monetary fines that you're looking at doing? Have you looked at other alternatives? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Mr. Thompson. Uh, Ms. Latour. Um, you know, I administer statute, and it, it's written the way that it is that the other alternative is, you know, um, we can't have open-ended, uncompleted candidates reporting and just say to them, you can't run in the next election, right? And that would just be how, how would, you know, we wouldn't be able to report on it. You know, we wouldn't be able to, it, it's just, that's really not an alternative. Um, 
we we have looked at a lot of different things like I mean but what we find that we're doing is we're just doing the work for the individuals uh, to bring them into compliance and they're not really truly complying um, in the event that the prosecution move forward which is the only avenue that I am afforded uh, is that uh, you know uh, a judge can give them uh, up to 2,000 and you know and, and there's other ramifications jail time but there's there's not a judge in this in this territory that's going to go into that so it really came down to us looking at the costs uh, of the efforts and so the suggestion is is that you know there's some uptake um, in in terms of um, the individual not being able to get a driver's license or that I simply write an invoice and it sits on the GNWT books as bad debt and the collector goes after them. Like there's a lot of different ways to deal with and I have talked about it, other alternatives in the recommendation. Um, but it just seems that, you know, we're just taking the burden and putting it uh, on onto the government and I don't know if that's an ideal situation. Um, so it, it Unless you have another solution, the only thing that we could say is that, well, 250 isn't enough of a deterrent if we up that and it becomes more serious and we educate to that end um, that we would get compliance. Also, if, like I said, if we had uptake on 44 and 45, we probably wouldn't have to deal with 46 very often. Okay, thanks, Ms. Latour. Mr. Thompson? Thank you, Mr. Turin. Thank Ms. Latour for the answer. I'm done on this section. Okay. Um, any other questions on this one? No? Okay. Uh, thanks again for highlighting some issues here. Uh, uh, let's move on to uh, 47, which is about uh, the term of appointment for returning officers. Ms. Latour, if you could briefly introduce this one. Thanks. Great. Thank you. As I said earlier, this is something I probably should have included in my initial CEO report. Uh, I just, uh, it got missed and I'm of course in the, um, you know, having uh, had uh, terms expire, I'm into the recruitment mode. <laughs> um, the way that our office works, uh, I look at every election officer, especially the senior ones, as, a, as an investment and I, I want to keep them. I just don't understand, you know, sort of the bureaucratic process of them expiring every four years. Um, as long as I have the ability to rescind their appointment for whatever reason or if they choose to leave or they expire, <laughs> that um, we would fill it but um, you know we try and keep we try and retain as many returning officers as we can and build on their knowledge um, so this is just seems like a unnecessary process uh, that um, uh, could just be better served with a, a lifetime appointment and uh, and one interaction and being gazetted because that's a continual thing. We there's a series of forms, the gazetting, and then all the rest of it. Is it is it really again? Is it necessary? Is is the is the point? Because the good ones we're going to hang on to them with all our might. Okay. Thanks, Ms. Latour. Uh, any questions from committee? Uh, I've got one. Um, so maybe you can just help me better understand this. So when the uh, the returning officers appointed for the first time, presumably they, they, they have some sort of a form that they fill out with you. You have to go uh, as the, the CEO to uh, folks that, that handle the gazetting uh, and then the, the name is gazetted in there and it's basically for a four-year term in the, in the gazette listing. Um, and I see you shaking your head, that's good. Um, so the problem seems to be around the gazetting rather than the, the term of the appointment. Is that a correct way to, to characterize this? And I guess I wonder whether there might be some provision in the act to um, have an initial gazetting for the first time uh, an officer is appointed, but then that you would have the, the authority to reappoint them just through a, a letter or a form that could be posted to your website or something. Uh, might that be another alternative for, for handling this? Uh, and that might necessitate some changes to the act, the way that, that it reads now. But would that be another way to handle this? Thanks. Thank you. I think you're essentially saying what we're doing right now. 
And what I'm saying is that if we appoint somebody, um, they're gazetted and they stay appointed. So I send them an oath, uh, an appointment, and they take an oath. And then that comes back and write a letter and over to justice it goes and they get gazetted. And then in accordance with the act, it expires a year after polling day. Um, and then we go through the same thing. So it's, it's on the phone to find the person saying, hey, I need to resend you a form. Can you resign the form? And they're like, we're not going anywhere. It's like, I know, but this is the way it is. Resign the form. We have to chase some of them for a bit of that and get them back to the form when they don't have any intention of leaving and we have no intention of letting them go. Now, some people do move away, and then there's maybe instances where we feel that the individual should not continue for one reason or the other as a returning officer, and then I think we should have the obligation to inform that individual and, and rescind the appointment and uh, go ahead with a new oath and a new, uh, you know, appointment and a new gazetting. Um, but it would essentially, the complement of officers would just stay as it is with uh, some moving in and out in certain electoral districts, as opposed to all of them being done in four years and then finding more and then in between anybody who may move or expire or whatever leaving. So it's just a, a constant process. I just say we just do it when it's necessary. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, not sure uh, that helps me a lot, but uh, so when, when uh, the, the term for a returning officer expires, uh, and I don't know, presumably they're appointed before the election, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe five or six months or something before, I don't know, you can, you can help me with understand that, and then their term's going to expire before that. So you've got to track down all those individuals anyways um, uh, to find out if they're still living here, they're still interested, they're available uh, in doing the work and so on. Um, so. Uh, I'm trying to understand, uh, I understand that, that there's probably some front end work that has to be done in terms of contacting the gazetting people, uh, but is there not, uh, you've still got to contact these people, find out if they're still here, they're available. Is there a way to change the act so that you can get rid of the gazetting stuff, at least if they, 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 they return, they, they're coming back a second time or third time or fourth time? Um, is that a, a, an option? Because you still have to go out and make sure they're still around if, if you want to retain them. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, as the act is written, their appointment uh, expires a year after polling day. And as the act is written, I must always have returning officers appoint, appointed. My office must be election ready at all times. Okay. So okay. I, I have to go out and find them. And we have uh, a different approach in our officers. I don't think there's, in the past years, uh, there's been as much contact. I call it soft contact. We do newsletters with them. We have a different type of relationship because they're not engaged the same way as other returning officers in the country. We don't pay them mm -hmm. a stipend. We don't have this. We don't have that. But we're in we're in fairly. Um, I'm going to say fairly constant contact with them. We know who and where people are at for the most part much more than we did before. Um, it's just that we have to go through this bureaucratic process. Like I say, it's like, okay, everybody expires at the same time. And then we got to find the 19. And then we have some that aren't continuing on or we have vacancies. And right now we have ads in the paper and in, on social media in place trying to fill those vacancies. It's a very, very difficult thing to do, let me tell you. Uh, so um, I, I'm not, from that perspective, I'm not election ready because if somebody runs over by a bus tomorrow, one of the members, and we need an election in a certain area, um, you know, if I have a vacancy, I, I have to find somebody to, to fill it. And, I, and so it's the intent is to, after the expired, the, four, the appointments have expired, go out and get a new complement of officers and always have a complement of officers. Um, so it's just, yeah, it's just the process of us having to phone them and say, hey, uh, and it's three years prior to the next event. You know, as it's written right now, uh, hey, are you still in? Or you know, they're like, yes, yeah, we're sure we're still in. But two years down the road, when this has happened, we're like, you know what? I've decided I'm moving to BC and, uh, and I'm out. So I'm just saying we should just do the work when it's necessary. That we just have the standing that it's an appointment, and we just it, it doesn't need to be renewed uh, unless there's cause. Okay, thanks. Um, any other questions from committee members? No? Okay. Um, 
So I'm just conscious of the time here. Um, I know that we'd like to move on to your uh, some specific areas of your white paper as well, but uh, maybe now might be a, a good time for a short break. And then uh, so we could take five or ten minutes for a break. And uh, if we could start again, maybe at 10:25, and then we'll, we'll shift focus now from uh, the supplemental report to the uh, the white paper. And there's some specific areas that the committee had uh, written to Ms. Latour uh, that we would like to have a bit more detailed discussion around some of the recommendations in there. So we'll take a few minutes break now. But thanks.
Thanks. We're, we're all back again. Uh, thanks, everybody, for keeping the, the break almost as short as we had asked. So, uh, so we're going to move on to the uh, white paper um, that uh, uh, the CEO has uh, submitted to the uh, Speaker of the, of the Assembly and was tabled in the House, um, I think it was back in about March. Um, and just so everybody understands, the, uh, the committee has been looking at the white paper, um, and we did identify some areas in the white paper that we were hoping to discuss further with the chief electoral officer, and uh, that was communicated with her uh, last week. So the areas of the, the white paper that we were hoping to discuss further uh, are the following areas, powers of the chief electoral officer, uh, control of staffing levels and appointments, power to make recommendations for legislative change, and uh, enforcement authority. So, um, and sorry, uh, Ms. Latour, if I spring this on you, but maybe w what we'll do is we'll take each of these uh, uh, as we go through, and maybe I could get you to make some introductory remarks about uh, each of them, and then we can get into a bit more of a, a discussion, if that's okay. So, um, and, and look, we, we, we know that your report covers a variety of other areas. I think it's fair to say that the committee um, has uh, carefully reviewed the report. Uh, there's some areas that we're probably going to agree with, some that we may feel are outside of our area uh, of uh, jurisdiction, and some areas that we may not agree with, but we wanted to have this opportunity to talk about some of them in more detail. So the first one was about the uh, powers of the uh, Chief Electoral Officer, so uh, um, maybe you can even start with some introductory remarks about why you felt uh, the, the white paper uh, was necessary and uh, what you're trying to achieve with it, and then if you can give some further remarks about powers of the Chief Electoral Officer, uh, which I think are one of the main concerns or issues raised in the report. Anyways, maybe we'll start with that. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I had a look at the, the sections that you sort of flagged for, for additional questions, and I think a lot of this is just um, stuff that uh, we're currently doing. It, we just There's a need for it to, I think, be formalized uh, through amending the Act. Um, like I said in my, in my opening remarks, um, I, and I don't know if everybody did receive that briefing note about the, uh, the, the CEOs, every CEO uh, since David Hamilton in 2003 has said, and it becomes very, you know, very quickly apparent to anybody that sits in the chair, uh, that how things are going right now is not working. Um, we're sort of with one foot in one world, the government world, and another in independence. and. Uh, it's, it's, it's extremely frustrating at times uh, to have to essentially abide by and, and work for the government uh, to get things done. And when it's, uh, it's, it's a, perhaps a slower turning wheel than what our operational needs are, uh, and we extend a great deal of effort and time in meeting um, some of the policies and practices of the GNWT. So it's really about taking the office once it, once it broke off and Nunavut uh, became its own. And, and uh, Mr. Hamilton at the time was the clerk and the CEO, but he took and made it two hats. Um, since that point in time, the office hasn't evolved. And, and that's, I think, uh, a bit of an issue. And I think the office in itself has uh, perhaps suffered a little bit uh, from a revolving door in leadership. And so it's been brought forward and then hasn't, it's failed to reach fruition in terms of addressing some of the issues. And again, it's further frustrated by the fact that with each assembly, we get a new board of management and new committees and we have to re-educate them as, as we're having these discussions and questions today. I'm sure you're all learning really about what it is that we do. Uh, but people, uh, the legislators and we find the administrators don't actually know what we do and fail to understand our needs and um, there's no interest in it essentially in, in, uh, in, hearing, in hearing us. Uh, but it's what we're doing right now. It, it doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense, and it's 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 frustrating. And in some instances, um, 
the office which is supposed to be independent is is suffering from government interference and there's like says very there's an ambiguity uh, around where uh, the authority of the board of management uh, and the authority of the chief electoral officers stop and start yes the office of the chief electoral officer uses crown funds but currently my office doesn't even provide an annual report so that you understand our challenges and milestones so there's no like I said it's not about fixing a model there's no model and it's very difficult when you have the board of management over here deciding uh, making budgetary decisions and then we have this committee over here doing its work and and what you know what costs could be associated um, with taking up recommendations or doing some of the things that we're discussing today or have been discussing through the last year um, and you know I have a certain obligation to be uh, election ready that's my mandate and I'm not um, there's no mechanisms in place uh, for me to develop a relationship uh, to report to, I report to the assembly you guys through the speaker but I work for the electorate and it's a, it's a voter centric thing that the business that we do so everything is, is um, you know they like clients it's to their interest and I, I do understand the relationship in, in, in receiving crown funds from here and I understand the relationship of being a statutory officer to the legislative assembly but there's certain uh, processes and procedures that are absent there's and there's you know there's so the white paper provides the framework in in realizing that this was an ongoing issue I thought it was just best to propose resolutions to some of the things that uh, I'm experiencing in trying to manage the affairs of my office as opposed to saying we got a problem and just leaving it open-ended so put forth the white paper engaged one of the leading um, uh, consultants in the country on this he's not only done it for me this white paper but he's done it for a couple of other provinces to put forth the best thing and like I said it's not an exercise in empire building uh, it's to try and bring my office up to the national standards from an operational authoritative accountable perspective independence so my um, request of Mr. Gibson the author of the majority of this report was to look at what we're doing right now what we have was to do a comparative analysis of the other national jurisdictions what they're doing was to draw some conclusions and to make some recommendations to bring us up to that national standard that allows some of the frustrations uh, and and they're you know they're 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 many uh, to to be uh, taken care of and I think provides uh, me with the ability to make decisions and then manage um, an agency that has a very unique undulating operating model in a more efficient uh, way uh, without me having to work for the for the government to do that so it's really about taking it's 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 a growth thing uh, the uh, the office is still in its infancy and getting it to stand on its own two legs uh, but at the same time respecting the reporting mechanism and respecting that the agency does ask for use and should account for the crown funds okay uh, thanks for that uh, appreciate that that introduction if we can just <clears throat> move into uh, a bit more of a discussion around some of the, the recommendations uh, in your report so the first area that the um, committee had identified um, is an area where we wanted to chat with you some further some more was about uh, some of your recommendations around uh, powers of the uh, chief electoral officer so um, and I'll be upfront with you what we decided to do was to divvy up some of these so I'm going to take the lead on on this section and sure. some of my colleagues will take a lead on some of the other sections so um, so your first recommendation uh, and it's on page 13 of your report in the area around powers of the chief electoral officer is about uh, um, giving you the or your office the authority to prepare and distribute policies and guidelines for election officers and employees of elections NWT so um, 
and uh, the power to vary such policies and guidelines to existing circumstances. Maybe can you just give us a bit of background as to why um, you feel this is necessary? Thanks. Okay. Um, th these the four points in this section, I'm just going to say, are mostly things that we're already doing, that this would just sort of formalize it. But for example, um, the returning officers and all the other election workers are not public servants. So perhaps there's a need, um, in rather than saying, oh, you just follow the GNWT travel uh, policies, say when we're, when, for example, when we're moving them for training, we should really um, have our own, independent of the governments, and um, you know what the per diems are. Even if they, even if they do mirror the governments, and this is essentially sort of what we're doing anyway. There's no, it doesn't make much sense to recreate the wheel, but. Uh, there may be a need for us to uh, make a change or make an addition that is unique or differs from government policy. And we need to be able to say this is elections NWT uh, travel policy. So uh, like I said, on some level, a lot of this stuff we're, we're already doing. It's a formalization uh, in the statutes to, to just to, to put, put it in writing. And give good guidance. If I'm, if not, I'm not here, the next person that comes in will be able to consult and, and know uh, their level of authority, the, the powers that they have. Okay, thanks for that. Um, without getting into a long discussion and debate, uh, you, you do have authority under the, the Act already to uh, uh, exercise general direction and supervision over the conduct of elections and plebiscites. Uh, require all election officers to comply with the Act. Uh, uh, there's, there's a number of authorities uh, laid out here. You can adapt the Act as, as necessary. Um, you can delegate uh, matters to the Deputy Chief Electoral Officer. So I guess we're just trying to understand uh, more specifically what what it is you want to change with the Act that is there some limitations with the act of the way that it's been crafted that doesn't set this out clearly enough in your views or uh, what, what can you give us some some uh, help here as to what specific changes you want to see with regard to say sections 8 9 10 12 15 of the act thanks yeah i think uh, you know mr uh, gibson sums it up there on page 12 in the second paragraph that the powers associated with the role of CR are not clearly defined with regard to general management and operations. So it's just really about solidifying it in a little bit more, I think, uh, concrete way. Um, you know, in some ways, it, it ties the CEO to exactly <coughs> this, the way that it's written, what you just shared. Uh, it gives us uh, it's, it's more leeway. Um, but uh, it's um, it's just a formalization of stuff that I think that's already already going on. Okay, thanks. Um, maybe I'll just move on to uh, the second one here, which is about uh, um, the ability to suspend, remove from office any officer, election officer for disability, misconduct, and neglect of duty, uh, appoint. Uh, temporary uh, employees as well. Um, do you not have that ability already under the Act? Thanks. Well, again, it's stuff that we're absolutely doing because, um, you know, within the RIP period, we had two officers that were replaced, unbeknownst to other people, for disability and, and uh, uh, I guess, disability on both counts, but in, a different, in different ways. So, um, yeah, if they're unable to fulfill their role, there there is something in that short term that allows me to move uh, either the assistant returning officer or whatnot into into that position. Um, and of course, you know, I have the ability to to appoint a returning officer every four years. So I think this again just um, breaks it down to be a little bit more specific of the practice that we already have. Okay, thanks. Um, and I, I guess uh, just to be really clear, uh, disability has, uh, there's a, a definition, of course, in the Human Rights Act around disability. Um, your your uh, use of the word here is really around the uh, 
inability of somebody to, to carry out the, the, the duties of a, as a returning officer. So, yeah, correct. And I mean, maybe this language needs to change slightly to, to, for that, for reasons of sickness or whatever. But for example, one returning officer uh, broke her foot two or three days into the writ period and was not able to continue for that reason. And it's more, it speaks more to, I think, situations such as that. And, and maybe the language as, as, as is written here uh, could be adjusted to reflect that type of need the, other than the overall disabilities as, as we understand it up here. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that clarification. Just want to make sure there was no, uh, no one who's listening that might misinterpret that. The, uh, another recommendation here uh, is with regard to, uh, I think it's your fifth bullet, which is about uh, um, using different methods uh, for uh, um, a, uh, a by-election. Um, do you not have that discretion already uh, under the Act, or what's, the, what's this recommendation really trying to get at? Thanks. Um, I think that's just probably more of a progressive uh, suggestion. Um, some um, jurisdictions are using uh, different uh, means in by-elections. Uh, for example, uh, Elections Canada may begin to use uh, an online a platform for some of their by-elections. I mean, it's not it's not set in stone, but there's certainly uh, we just had a, a discussion about it yesterday that certain, sometimes uh, by-elections um, uh, can be tailored for a specific a specific need. And it's just to have the flexibility, say, maybe, I don't know, if a tabulator needs to be used or something of that nature if they, if they want to, you know. Um, not that my la act allows for that, but I think it's just a sort of a, a bit of a recommendation for how things may continue to evolve in the elections management world. Okay, thanks. So uh, essentially what you're, I, I see from Section 9 of the Act that, uh, you know, if you're the opinion that a mistake, miscalculation, emergency, or unusual or unforeseen circumstance uh, happens, that you have the ability to change uh, the way that the Act would work and so on. Uh, but this is more about uh, maybe perhaps a conscious effort to trial a different way or a different piece of voting equipment or a different way of voting in a by-election and see if we can learn something from that. Is, is that a proper characterization of that? Yes, Clause 9 can seem to be a bit of a catch-all. You know, we joke about it being the God Clause uh, for some, for, you know, unique situations that we have to be able to manage them in the moment. This, I think, is just, uh, again, to be a little bit more explicit about the powers that, yeah, you can go this way, as opposed to having to revert to Clause 9 and saying, well, I always have this to fall back on. Okay, thanks. I think uh, I have better understanding of that now. Um, Maybe I can move on to uh, probably the last one in this section, which is uh, um, it's the last right recommendation that you make in this section, and I think it's found on uh, page uh, 13 of your report. Uh, you want to, uh, or, or the, the report recommends that uh, be able to enter into agreements uh, with any person or government department. Uh, for the purpose of providing address, mapping, demographic or geographic information, including geospatial information. So we're just trying to understand what that's all about and um, who would sort of have control over this information and what, what's really meant by uh, geospatial information. I think if you can help clarify that for us, that would be helpful. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Uh, to be completely honest, it's, again, a forward-looking recommendation, and I'm not, um, when you say geospatial, to me, I, I get itchy. Uh, it's, uh, it's really about how the uh, election management bodies and business is evolving um, in the moment. 
um, electoral boundary commissions, when they do their <coughs> stuff, they really just want maps that, what happens if we put the boundaries like this, having electors geocoded in those areas, and this, this would get us this, or this would get us that, but also to help determine um, polling divisions, which you know, they've been saying it for quite a few years, <laughs> I think probably 15 more so years, that polling divisions will eventually become obsolete. But there's still a need to have address ranges that assign an elector to an electoral division. But um, that we're continuously growing and going towards a, a digital online uh, platform um, in, in all aspects of management. And this just says that um, that as I think it suggests that as, as we evolve and as we go there, it, it gives the, the power to the CEO to go ahead and, and work with the varying uh, experts in that field to ensure, you know, uh, we keep with, essentially we keep with the times, I guess, in the management. Okay, thanks. Uh, that, that's helpful in understanding, I think, some of the potential use of this. One of the other issues I think we had um, discussed was uh, – um, you know, it talks about agreements for, <coughs> excuse me, sharing information. So what sort of controls would be there beyond your office sharing information with an, an outside party? Thanks. <coughs> right now we work with uh, a government department, uh, Geomatics, and they look after our maps and things of that. We get requests from individuals, private individuals doing various studies and have a need for our data, and I believe they're called the request the spatial, what are we, the requests that we get? Shape files, that's it. We get a lot of requests for shape files. And so um, our agreement with uh, Geomatics is uh, uh, that I approve that this individual for their purposes can use it. Geomatics, uh, in releasing the data to them, ensures that it's not manipulated in a way that is not acceptable to either Geomatics and or my office. And um, that's uh, something we can, you know, during the last election we got quite in quite a bit of an arm wrestle with CBC who wanted to take the maps and just round lines and do a bunch of this and Geomatics says forget it. So they're the keepers of, of that for us and that's the relationship that we have there. But I know from other agencies and uh, how, how it's moving out that there will probably be uh, eventually uh, um, will be other uh, agencies and experts engaged in, in uh, advancing that uh, technology. Uh, thanks for that. That's quite helpful. Um, I didn't have anything further on this area. I'm just looking at other members of the committee. Folks okay with that? Perhaps we'll, we'll move on to the, the next area if that's okay. So I, th I think the next area of your, the white paper where we were hoping to uh, have a bit more of a discussion is around uh, your recommendations. Um, uh, on uh, control of staffing levels and appointments, and I'm going to go to uh, Mr. Thompson for this area. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in regards to in the white paper, it says the CEO is not permitted to exercise authority to employ office staff without second review and approval from the Legislative Assembly. Um, can you please explain to us what you meant by this in the process? My understanding of hiring staff is that you work with HR, or the, whatever organization or department you're working with, to hire the staff. So can you please explain what was meant by this in the, the paper? Thank you, Mr. Chair. HR is one of the, probably the biggest frustrations of all that we have to contend with. Um, my act says that I am supposed to be free to hire anybody uh, that I feel that I need to administer the act. And I don't think that that is intended to be specific to just the writ period and poll workers. Um, like I continue to say, the uniqueness of our operations and how we uh, swell to, you know, 400 persons on polling day and how we need to engage those people and pay those pe people is one specific issue, but also how the office of the chief electoral officer is staffed is another issue. Um, 
there seems to be a disconnect between what I believe my act says in being able to hire people as I need them, but I'm having to conform to government policy and procedures. So um, recommendation 42 in my, in my acts is that we need an organizational review and this is part and parcel of what's happening because right now um, how I am staffed does not meet my needs. Uh, I am supposed to be election ready and I am not. I am without a deputy chief electoral officer and that makes me not election ready. Uh, when I have to leave my office or I choose to leave my office for personal reasons, there is nobody there to authorize payments or manage staff or do anything of that nature. That is not a decision that I made. That is a decision that was made by the Board of Management and I have absolutely no recourse for that. And I can tell you by contract, personal contract, I am entitled to staff and have a deputy chief electoral officer. I also have individuals in my office because we're, you know, uh, I have an individual there that was uh, a shared person. The human rights <coughs> adjudication panel was there and uh, that individual was busy um, continuously when not doing election work, was doing work for somebody else. That, that office split off. It's not with us, wasn't our decision. So I have an individual that has really little or nothing to do right now. My office goes into a very low operational mode. We don't, the phone doesn't ring. We have very few invoices that need to cross the desk. But meanwhile, I have this individual there and I'm not free to make decisions on that. I, I don't have a deputy. I got a beautiful amount of money for education to develop, but I was withheld the person that's in charge of that. Um, so it's really concerning for me uh, that I have to uh, have all my uh, staffing needs and wants approved uh, by the Board of Management. I, so this is where my concern comes in is what does my act say? Do I have this authority? And um, I find myself in a position, mother may I. So when I wanted to go and get an as and when contract for the financial officer because I can't keep them on full pay with just trickling in and I just need to engage them. If, if I do get a CFR, can you come in and negotiate that after hours and, and all the rest of that to be told by the Department of Human Resources that I can't do it, that I need the approval of the, uh, the clerk over here. My act says that I need to administer the act and to administer the act I need to get that CFR in and I need to get it published, right? And I understand fiscal restraint and I'm a commerce major. I lead with my commerce degree and in business I understand money. But if we have an individual that I'm paying salary and benefits to but has little or nothing to do, then I need to be, have the freedom to make those changes without being questioned or without having to ask permission of somebody else. If I need to rewrite a job description, I should be able to write a job description that fits the individual and the work that needs to be done in the office. So again, we're having to abide by policies and procedures um, and that are GNWT policies and procedures and they don't fit. And it's really, um, it doesn't make sense in the long run and it's costly. Um, I know what my office's needs are. I have an individual that is my communications and research office, officer. We do research and you know, all the time. We all in my office do research, but she, she, she leads the lion's share. But, but what are we doing in communications right now? You know, so maybe I need to bolster her job and give her a responsibility and we need to make these changes. And sometimes things happen in my office that means I should have to, you know, I should be able to say, okay, you're going to be responsible for this. But the process is I must go back, rewrite the job description, go through job evaluation, have it awarded. If it's changed too much, uh, she has to be given notice as an affected worker and has to reapply on the job that's a better fit for my operation just for me to administer the act. And administering the act is about developing educational tools and needs. I work in a four year cycle. The year after an election we do the analysis and we do reporting. And then we do the development and, and, and then we need to you know, move on with planning and development and then we need to move on to implementation and then we're into an event year. And there's all these different needs. That individual that I'm saying that has nothing to do right now 
is critical during it, but perhaps that should be a casual individual that I hire when I need it and it makes sense, as opposed to this is your PY and it's done, and this PY over here you can't have it because uh, we're not, we, we're having fiscal issues and we're not going to give you the money for that. For me, that translates to government interference. That, that person deserves to be in that chair, be comfortable with their knowledge, and, and be involved in the development and the implementation along the way because they take on significant responsibility when we roll out an event. So to essentially handcuff me uh, means that I have to ask an individual with a set job description to do things that are outside of that job description, right? And uh, I take on whatever, but, but I don't have the freedom to spread it out and do things. I need to have individuals that are cross-trained. So if somebody gets ill, whatever may happen, that there's somebody else there to pick it up in the moment. So I need this flexibility, and I'm not afforded that. And there's been instances in my um, interactions with the Human Resources Department that they just they, they don't make sense. And, I mean, my point uh, to the speaker last fall was, you guys pay me to manage, and at some point in time, you're going to have to trust me. And we're continuously saying that these um, policies and procedures that we're having to work within, they don't fit us. But there's no, you know, like, there's no understanding about that. And so this is part and parcel to, to just allow me to have that authority and the freedom to do what we need. And, and acknowledging that we're not a government department. I said that at the beginning. I'm not a director of a division. And, in, and when we swell to pay 350 workers, that we're not sitting there generating three or four pieces of paper and setting somebody up as a vendor and doing all this. I, I included the appendices of what it costs us to pay a witness, because we're still bound to having witnesses as the act is, $50. It costs us more money to cut the check than the $50. But it has to go through how many different avenues, and we in our office have to generate four or five, it's, it's, it's amazing how many pieces of paper and the work that we have to do to set this up as opposed to saying, you know what, maybe we should outsource this portion of it and just give a, a, a pay agent um, a set pay sheet. We work off a tariff of fees. We work off of flat, flat rates. It's not as complex. You know, it doesn't involve overtime. It doesn't involve benefits. It doesn't involve all these things. Um, that, that we, they can just say, okay, John Bob gets 50 bucks, this guy 50 bucks, and they just cut, cut checks or make direct deposits in, in the moment, right? But government policy has us doing this and doing this and doing this, and, and we're just, we spend most of our time working to just operate as opposed to just operating in a sensible way. So there needs to be some consideration. And again, I'm not somebody that's going to reinvent the wheel. I would like to look at what we have. And, and use it if it makes sense, but to have the freedom to have a uh, unique set of considerations or policies that meet it. And right now, I don't have that. So um, what level of authority do I have? Am I independent or am I dependent on the government? That's, that's the position that, that I'm in. And like I said, I understand the relationship and I know that I use Crown funds, but I think that once I make a presentation to the Board of Management and I say this is what I would like to, to use the money for, and then I provide you with uh, you know, uh, an accounting every year through an annual report, like here's what happened, here's our challenges, here's our milestones, uh, that that should be sufficient. If they think that there's anything um, inappropriate going on, then I would suggest that I should be audited. But if I need to travel to an event or, you know, I'm paying a bill, I, I have to ask for permission to travel. I pay my bills and I authorize them here, and they come for a second approval there. Is, does that make sense? Is it necessary? Can we not negotiate something that's a little bit more simple and have some of that work done in our office? These are the, these are the discussions that I would like to have. Uh, that don't that don't happen. But when it comes to the human resources, there's there's two pools. There's things that are going on with the office of the chief electoral officer, and things going on with how we need to manage our, our workers and 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 be smarter in that. When we are talking about accountability and transparency, I want to ensure that that exists, right? 
So we just, you know, doing things the way that we've always done them isn't necessarily something that we should, you know, continue to embrace. I think we should look to new, more sensible ways. And you know what? In the end, it's my neck. We always we joke. My colleagues and I joke. Election uh, chief electoral officers. We're like a hockey team. We're the coach. We can be gone at any time. Right? So I accept the responsibility in making good business decisions and knowing what our needs are. I, I just need the understanding and being able to, if we need to step outside of something, to step outside of it. Not being saying, oh, this is how we do it. This is, you know, and then, and, and essentially becoming another government department because we're, we're tied to the Legislative Assembly. So again, it's about growing the office, um, you know, getting out of this dependency to the independence. Okay, thanks uh, for that. Um, Mr. Thompson? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Latour, thank you for the answer. I guess I'm trying to understand is that, you know, you're talking about developing something for election NWT, but presently we have an HR a job evaluation process. We have the affirmative action. Are you looking at circumventing this and just coming up with your own? Is that what you're recommending with this report? Or are you looking at, as you said here, maybe modifying it to meet your needs? So can you please clarify what's trying to be done here with this? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Thompson. Uh, uh, Ms. Latour, I'll ask you to just try to be a little bit briefer. Um, uh, we're, we have to. We have another committee meeting at uh, noon, and we still have a lot of uh, items to cover here. Thanks. Uh, then to be very quick about it, um, I need the level of authority just to make the decisions that I need to make, and not have to go through a second approval process. If I give direction to the human resources about changes that I need to make, then we just move forward from there. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Thompson. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank Ms. Latour for her answer. So you're just saying that you want to bypass um, the relationship, that you make recommendations, it goes to bomb, and then it comes back. You're just saying you want to be able to make the work with HR, make recommendations, and move forward, and that's, that's the step is to streamline it as best you can, but following government practices and policies that we presently have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Mr. Thompson. Ms. Latour? Yes, I mean, these uh, my employees are, go are public servants. They're excluded workers. And um, I think that, uh, you know, the affirmative action and the hiring policies for the most part are, are worthwhile and beneficial to them, to protect them. I'm not suggesting stepping outside of that. Um, what I think my problem is is that um, uh, with, with how it is currently is that I have to have come and ask permission to make uh, decisions in terms of personnel. So when I'm told that I, you know, I need the approval of the, the clerk for an as and when, it seems to contradict the level of authority that I have in my act. And if I decide that I need to restructure my office to better meet the needs, um, I should be able to do that freely without having to come to the Board of Management because to me that seems like micromanaging. It seems like overreaching. I, I, I'm the CEO and I know what the needs are and I'm a fair person and I mean what, what, what is the purpose of a second approval? Uh, be, because right now that's how it's structured and apparently you know I don't have DM level authority as my colleagues do which is touched upon in the white paper so I must come and get DM approval over here. Um, so does that not undermine the independence of my office? That's, I guess, sort of where I'm, where I'm at. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Mr. Thompson? Uh, sorry, I'm just looking through my notes and sure. kind of a lot of information here and just trying to check things off here. In the recommendations here, it says you talk about uh, your staff being public service it's presently there, so why is that recommendation in this white paper that I think it says CEO, Deputy CEO and other staff are members of the public service, and this is currently the case under Section 14 and 15. So can, is there a rationale for this? Is it, because if it's already there, I don't know why we're asking, to, we're making that same recommendation. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Mr. Thompson. Ms. Latour. And I think this is uh, Mr. Gibson's suggestions on how just to uh, explain it in a more uh, direct and simple way. It, a lot of this is, is uh, you know, um, most of what's in this report are things that we do do, but it's just how it's written or presented. Okay, thanks, Ms. Latour. Um, Mr. Thompson? Uh, I think we've kind of covered that whole section uh, with Ms. Latour's uh, answers. Uh, so I think unless I'm missing something, maybe one of the other colleagues can pick up on it. But I think that covers everything. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, um, uh, Mr. Thompson. Any other questions on this section for uh, Ms. Latour? Let's give committee members here a minute to consider all this. No? Okay. So let's move on to um, the next area of uh, the, the white paper where we wanted to uh, chat with Ms. Latour. I think Mr. Thompson, you're up for this one as well, but it's uh, power to make recommendations to the Legislative Assembly. So. Um, Mr. Thompson, do you want to go ahead with that one? Okay, thanks. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I believe it's recommendation number three. It says CO shall submit all reports required directly into the legislation, the Legislative Assembly through the Speaker. This is the current practice. So what is the rationale for this in the white paper? Is it just to simplify things? Um, is that why it's that recommendation is there, or is it uh, because right now that's the present practice? You submit the white paper to the speaker, he tables it, and then it comes to committee or to the appropriate committee. So, is that is just simplifying it, or is there a reason for this being in there as it is? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Thompson. Ms. Latour. Yeah, it's, I, again, it's just uh, I think uh, a formalization of what of what does go on. My act only speaks to me submitting two reports, uh, and um, so the white paper actually <clears throat> is a bit of a, a different, uh, e unique, uh, I'm even precedent-setting kind of instant. Um, there is no we we found out there is no formal way uh, to submit. Uh, additional materials to legislators, and uh, I I did this in December in the way that I thought was probably the best, um, but perhaps that should be formalized. I I know that my office has talked to the legislative officer here to find out as we educate ourselves on what the process should be and we found out there actually is no formal process for statutory offices to bring stuff forward so there there there's that this just says that any reports required uh, through through to the legislative assembly through the speaker uh, and I've done that uh, twice um, in addition to the two that are I'm legislatively bound to, to submit. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Mr. Thompson. We're good for that. Okay, maybe we can move on then to uh, um, the next part of the, the report where we wanted to chat with you is the Brown Enforcement Authority. And I'm going to turn to uh, Ms. Green for... Uh, this area. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So we're now looking at pages 30 to 37 <coughs> of the white paper. And um, th there's um, recommendations that uh, that are about uh, your ability to investigate um, conduct that's brought to your attention. Why do you feel that you don't have uh, enough authority in this area at this point? Thanks, Ms. Green. Ms. Latour. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I don't feel that. Um, again, this is a formalization of stuff that we do do. It's just um, um, laying it out, I think, in a, in a more specific manner, the language. OK, 
Okay, thanks, Ms. Latour. Ms. Green? Is that true for all of these recommendations? That, that, that this doesn't represent anything new, it just represents uh, formalization of current practice? Thanks, uh, Ms. Green. Uh, Ms. Latour? Um, I think the second one listed on 37 uh, is a little bit more explicit and probably covers some new ground off the top of my head. Um, and I think the third point uh, with respect to public interest is also probably something that should be incorporated as well because there are uh, instances, uh, you know, matters that become of public interest and people uh, wish to know the outcome of it. If somebody, especially with this, uh, specific accusations or things of that nature. Okay, so what, what I understand then with respect to the, the first point that you made is that um, you are seeking uh, the um, legislated right to investigate any matter that comes to your attention, including by visiting the premises of the person who is under investigation and looking at his or her records. Is, is that correct? Thanks, yeah. Ms. Green. Ms. Latour? Sorry. Um, yeah, I think, like I said, that, that, all, that power already exists. This is just a different way, I think, of, of presenting it. Um, Thanks, Ms. Latour. Ms. Green? So then the, the ones that fall out of this are uh, a new uh, provision that would make it an offense to uh, obstruct your investigation. So uh, where, where, where did this idea come from? Is this something that you have experienced in the past that needs to be solidified or is this something that you're trying to align with the rest of the country or both? Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Green. Ms. Latour? No, again, um, this already exists in the Act. The powers exist. This is just a different way of uh, formalizing, you know, the the, uh, the 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 powers, I guess, investigative powers. Thanks, Ms. Latour. Ms. Green. Uh, yeah, my final question here is about making uh, the outcome of your investigations public. Uh, why wouldn't you make them public? What in what circumstances wouldn't they be public? Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Green. Ms. Latour. Again, that's something that generally that we do uh, anyway. Um, uh, I didn't have any need this event, but uh, uh, I know that uh, in the, in the, when I was deputy chief for, for the prior event, um, it was certainly something uh, that we do, we do do, and it, 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 there's allowance for it in the Act again. It's just a, a different way of uh, formalizing that practice. Thank you. What was wrong with my questions on that area? Thanks, Ms. Green. Um, maybe I can just ask uh, <clears throat> um, about this uh, ability to make your uh, investigations results public or not. Uh, there might be some allegations that might be raised during uh, an election that, uh, in your view, may be frivolous or vexatious or whatever that they really don't warrant an investigation or that you're able to investigate very quickly uh, and uh, reach a conclusion on. Um, would there be any reason to not release that report just because uh, it could affect a candidate's uh, chances at getting elected? Uh, I don't know. It's a weird, it could be a weird situation, but I, I, I guess I, I do see that the need perhaps for some discretion. Um, maybe during the election period or something, but is, th is that something that, that you've sort of thought about at all? Thanks. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, you always have to be cautious about about those types of matters and, and the ramifications, but uh, we're also uh, bound to be truthful and whatever the outcome may be is what the outcome may be and the public uh, has... Uh, you know, deserves that, uh, the truthfulness either way. Um, I would suggest that not very many investigations occur during the writ period, during the campaign mm -hmm. period. Most of them um, will, will come after, if at all. Um, I mean, certainly there are a lot of uh, complaints during the writ period, um, but it's the policy of the office uh, 
to in in order to sort of um, initiate one uh, to have a thorough, more thorough investigation. That complaint needs to come in writing. It needs to come in with, you know, uh, information um, and which section of the act is violated as well. So. Uh, if we adopt a procedure like that, um, I mean, I think, you know, we should be okay. It's really hard to predict <laughs> any number of situations, but I would say the majority of concerns that are brought forward are done so verbally and are easily, um, there's a, maybe a misunderstanding, correction of information, uh, educating either the public, maybe a candidate, official, or agent, whoever is involved in it, and, um, and generally that's enough. Thanks. Uh, appreciate that very much. Um, uh, just anything further on this uh, section? I, from uh, my colleagues here, I don't see any. Um, any. Any other questions for Ms. Latour while we've got her here? I, I, maybe a couple of points, if I could. Um, you mentioned that you had prepared a briefing note that sort of highlighted some of these, uh, as I might characterize it, independence issues uh, that, that uh, uh, previous CEOs have raised since 2003. I, I don't think we have that. If, if you could provide that to us, uh, that would be much appreciated. Yeah, we'll, we'll get you that uh, this afternoon. I, I did provide it to uh, uh, Speaker Lafferty uh, when, when I um, – uh, gave him the report, um, I, but I noticed that it wasn't tabled with the report. Um, so certainly it's available from our office, and we'll email that to you probably this afternoon. Um. Okay, that that'd be great. Um, just uh, so if there's no further uh, questions from my colleagues here, uh, maybe I'll just outline very quickly for the public what sort of process we're going to go through to to uh, conclude uh, our work on, on these issues. Um, uh, so we, the, the committee has received your supplemental report uh, on the, the, the conduct of the election. We've got the white paper as well. Uh, there hasn't really been a chance afforded to the public to make any comments on those, so we're going to uh, be contacting uh, the um, uh, candidates, their official, from the last election, their official agents, we will put it on our web page uh, uh, to solicit public input on those two uh, reports. Uh, I think the deadline that we're looking at is July the 14th, so that there will be a further opportunity for the public to come on, on either of those matters. Um, and the committee will continue to work away on these three reports. I don't think we're going to get any more. Is that a safe uh, uh, assumption? I'm done. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Great. I don't think we're going to have any further reports to look at. So uh, what we're targeting for is to get a report into the, the House in the fall on these matters so that there would be enough time to make changes to the uh, the Elections Act uh, before the next election. That's not something this committee would do, but uh, the report that we would uh, bring forward in the House might have some recommendations around that, and then that would go off to the Board of Management for drafting and presentation back in the House, uh, hopefully before the, the next election. But that's, that's sort of the next steps that we see. Uh, we, we recognize that you've done a lot of work and a lot of thinking about these issues. You've highlighted a, a number of uh, issues. You've made some ideas around uh, some uh, uh, solutions and, and uh, specific changes, and we certainly want to thank you for that. There's a lot of work that you and your office have done on this, and uh, we certainly recognize that. There's a lot of work for us to wade through here <laughs> as well. So. Uh, um, any concluding comments from my colleagues? Uh, if not, I'll turn to you, Ms. Latour, if you have any comments to, to close out. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, as I said when we began today, I know that I've, I've uh, given you a lot. Uh, and I think, <clears throat> you know, it's probably indicative of maybe, you know, progression. The elections management is, is moving very quickly but also um, with, uh, with the white paper just to, to uh, ensure that the office continues to evolve in, in a way. And I thank you for your time and the, the opportunity to come and discuss some of these things. Um, 
I'm available at any time through email or telephone to to take up any uh, even side questions or, or further clarify any any uh, matters that may stem from this. Uh, I'm looking forward uh, to uh, receiving the feedback on it. Uh, uh, like I know a lot of it is fairly progressive and to understand what um, direction my office will move in, what our work plans will look like and ultimately what the next election will look like for electors. Uh, this fall will be two years away from an event and I do believe in education and providing any changes that may result in amendments to the Act to the public and to my workers in a timely manner and, and, and educating. I think an educated uh, electorate is an engaged electorate and so uh, being able to share uh, that, that with them um, and educate the candidates, official agents, and, and anybody else involved in the event uh, is um, is great. So yeah, the runway is getting shorter, but I really do appreciate and understand how much work that you do do, and how much work that I've additionally given you through this. And um, I think, regardless of what the outcomes may be, that uh, that we're going to see some really positive movement. And uh, I'm thankful for that, and I'm thankful for your involvement in it. I hope that we can address the issue that's as I say, been ongoing with this assembly and have uh, greater clarification for myself and, and the work that we do. Great. Uh, thanks very much for that. So once again, we do appreciate you coming and chatting with us today about these matters. Uh, there's a couple of items you're going to follow up on. You're going to get us the briefing note, and I believe Ms. Green had asked a question about uh, the number of candidates that, that ran that were did not have access to financial institutions according to your table in your supplemental report. So we'll look forward to that information. Okay. But uh, thanks again and uh, big job ahead of us all. And I think we share some of the, the, the same goals about trying to make for better elections in the future. So uh, thanks again. Great. And I'll just ask my colleagues to stay behind uh, so we can uh, chat a little bit more. But uh, thanks again for Great. your uh, presentation and coming for us today.